Thanks for inviting me and inviting me on a topic that actually has no literature. And therefore, you'll see that I wish I had more evidence to give you, but uh, we'll run through it and then see what we need to do in the future. Um, disclosure, I just have a few grants that are not related to this topic and therefore have no conflict of interest. Oops. Um, I'll start with the case report, and I simplified the case for a few reasons, and that for uh, the patient, except for family members that seem to be in the room, won't recognize who it is. But it was an active woman who, in her 30s, presented to my clinic after an increasing weakness of the left quadriceps and hamstring, and some numbness in that left leg as well. And because she was actually extremely strong, people that had examined her before kind of said, you don't have a weakness because I can't see it. Um, and then if you tricked her a bit and tried to make her work against uh, her own strength instead of mine, then I was able to see that she was actually weaker on that side. The, um, she had been diagnosed a couple of years prior to that with um, GI issue and a um, Crohn disease. And uh, therefore, that complicated a bit the, the uh, history. And we did an MRI and showed that there was a fatty phylum, at, and her conus was too low. And I'll come back, because healthcare professionals in the room know what I'm speaking about, but I'll come back to what is a tether cord and come back on, on uh, simple things as embry embryology and so on. But basically, we operated on her, and she recovered with a full recovery. Still had a tiny bit of numbness, but except for that, was doing extremely well. Fatty phylum in the OR kind of look like that. Sometimes they're a bit more yellow. Sometimes they look exactly like a nerve root. And we have different ways of knowing whether it's a nerve or not, just to be sure that we're not actually cutting a nerve root. So five years later, she comes back to my clinic. And I had seen her in between, and she was doing well. But she says, well. I now have episode of leg uh, numbness, and she had presented to emerge with non-function of that left foot at all. Um, that was fluctuating, and when I saw her in clinic, she was a bit weaker, but actually uh, quite strong again. Um, we repeated an MRI, and the conus was now higher, um, and the question was whether uh, was it retethered or not. But because of her symptomatology being worse, and because of what I'd seen on the MRI, and I'll come back on that later, but basically I decided that I would reoperate, um, of course, after a lengthy discussion with her, and that was what she wanted. She didn't want to, she had the impression that she was getting worse over time. And in the OR, I was quite surprised, because typically in retethering of more complex cases, so where you just uh, don't have a fatty phylum but have somebody with a big lipomeningocele or a spiny bifida. Okay, we don't have to evacuate. So she, she didn't have a big scar. She had little bands of arachnoiditis and nothing else that would explain that tether cord. Um, but uh, overall, with a couple of, of complications after the OR, she returned to baseline and was doing well. Surprisingly, because she was better than us, and probably like a lot of you, um, she kind of said, well, you know what? There's a lot of things that don't make sense, and there's a lot of symptoms that I haven't disclosed here, but that she had that kind of made her think, well, maybe there is something else. Since she was speaking to a friend who said, well, go and check. And she was actually diagnosed with EDS. So what is tether cord? And basically, tether cord, you have to understand that it's when we speak about the uh, fatty phylum, which she had, is a little band that's uh, made of collagen bands and other things. Um, and typically is there to kind of keep the spinal cord um, in alignment and is used as a spring um, to kind of stabilize that uh, conus and the distal spinal cord uh, from every time you move around. We know, and, and that's something well known, if there is a bit of fat in it that we can see on the MRI, 
then it typically causes traction. And the normal cord that's supposed to go up when you grow as a fetus and then as an infant is not uh, growing with you. Now, in normal tether cord or in anybody else's tether cord, we can see that there's some fatty phyla, there's some little vascular uh, lacunes and some uh, neurons. A bit of embryology, and I'm going to make it pretty easy, okay? It's just to make you think that think might not happen only when uh, you're diagnosed, but a lot earlier. And basically, to form your neural tube, what you need to do is that when you're 18 days old, so probably your parents don't even know you are there, you are closing your spinal cord. And when you hear about spina bifida, so patients that, that have, instead of the full closure, have a, um, an open um, spinal cord, then they are not able to do that. We are not in that category. Then you have a secondary neural relation, which basically makes the central canal. So when you see a syrinx, it's that central canal that's enlarged because of something happening. Making it normal, and then the lower uh, part of the uh, spinal cord is also formed during that later, later neurulation. Now, when is the phylum made? Well, the phylum is actually going to happen a bit later, so after day 52, so that's about seven and a half weeks. Um, and your spinal, your spinal cord, which as an early fetus is going all the way down to the bottom of your coccyx, is now starting to not grow as fast as the rest of the embryo and the rest of the spine. And therefore, when your, your fetus is growing, you will see that the spinal cord and the conus is to both to go up. So, you have heard that before. And symptoms of tether cord can be slightly different. And not everybody needs to have the full list of it. And in children versus in adults, you might see slight difference as well. Overall, people might complain of back pain. They might have bladder issues. And it could be from a neurogenic bladder or just having more infections, having problems with incontinence or retention. Lower extremity sensory changes or motor changes, typically asymmetrical. Tightness of legs and complaining of cramps, and typically then you're referring to saying, eat some more magnesium and you'll get better. Um, you might have, especially again, that's more as a child. You because you're pulling on it, then you might have scoliosis or kyphoordosis. So basically, spine. your spine might be mm -hmm. going that direction, or kyphoordosis is you're like that or mm -hmm. too much like that. Again, in children, because they are growing, then you might actually see a difference between the legs and the way the, the feet are, so deformities. And you can find bowel incontinence, and incontinence or constipation. Imaging, typically, um, until recently, everybody would agree that if you have a low-lying conus below L2, then your spine is somewhat tethered. And typically, we were looking for fatty inf infiltration. And the controversy of upright versus prone versus supine MRI has been happening for a long time. Um, for example, in, in 2012, they kind of looked at the population scene, whether is, is upright or lying MRI better. Well, it seemed that every radiologist looking at it would agree on the level of the corners. Um, and that would be what seemed to be more accurate as a diagnostic. Again, might not work for everybody and might not work for the EDS population. So now let's come to tethercord in EDS. And already overall, um, that's why I did that little embryo uh, lecture, is because is it just people that were unlucky and have actually two things? So, well, when they were an embryo, then they were also so tethered, and we find the tether cord, but it has nothing to do with EDS. Could be a possibility. Other possibility is the fact that it's actually in relation. And again, if it's in relation, is it in relation because there is collagen in it, 
And therefore, when you're an embryo, it actually might not form the way it should already at that early um, stage. Or is it something that's more inflammatory, which has been shown um, in some studies? And again, it's more case report than really something published. Um, but I'll come back to it. We do find some uh, signs of inflammation in tethercord released that have been given to a pathologist after an operation in EDS patients. So overall, what's the incidence? Because to try to answer the different questions and knowing where it is in the tree and where is the answer, we need to know the incidence. Well, the problem is we barely know the incidence of tether cord in the general population. So there's a Turkish study showing that probably in children in Turkey, there's about 0.1% of, of um, children that might have a tether cord, which might be symptomatic or not. Now, I tried to look for evidence of um, tether cord in adults and evidence of EDS. So there's a lot of adult case reports. And the reason why I went to adults more than in children is typically we think of tether cord should reveal itself um, more in a child because you're still growing and you have your growth spurts and that's typically when your tether cord is going to reveal itself. As an adult, you would think that you have been that height for a while and therefore except if you have really strange activities, then you should be stable and that, that you'll have less patient revealing or having a diagnosis of tether cord at that point. So when we look at literature, over 500 cases have been reported, and there is no mention of EDS. Well, why? It's not because those patients didn't have EDS, it's because we didn't look for it. Um, so there is a report uh, to the Ministry of uh, Ontario in 2015, so a few years ago, and basically the only thing that was in it was the fact that in Ontario, in 2015, over 2012 and 2015, there were three adult that the court operated with EDS, and about five out of province request. There were more children, but no exact number either. So the only evidence I have to kind of say maybe we are going into something slightly different that embryologic in EDS is the fact that when we bring a piece of phylum to a pathologist and he looks at it under a microscope, he sees more things that we would see in a patient without EDS um, and a tether cord. So we see abnormal cluster of inflammation, some neutrophil and microphages. We see disruption of elastin fibers and a difference in the number of elastin versus collagen fibers. So we think that's normal to find that. Now, why would you see neutrophils and macrophages, and activated mast cells. And I'm sure you've heard a lot of about mast cells today, so it kind of rings about saying, well, is there something going on there? When we look at untethering overall, I'm going to use uh, the previous speaker uh, slide for the EDS patients, showing that overall you have more patients that improve than not, and same things with patients without EDS we see that the improvement of pain is actually quite high. The improvement of motor function is 50 to 60 percent in patients without EDS. Um, and the uh, improvement of sensory deficit is even a bit lower. So when we speak about retethering, the problem is where do we start? Because retethering means you have new symptoms after surgery, but you should have improved in between, right? Otherwise, you don't really know that it's a retethering. Overall, we typically think of it as scar tissue, um, and sometimes there's actually two phylums and we only cut one of them, and then they never really improve and we miss the second phylum. That's extremely rare, but it exists. So retethering overall, in a normal population, what we can find is about between two and 8%. And if we compare it to other as I said, more complex. So the spina bifida patient with myelomeningocele, we 
which have a lot of reason to have more scar tissue, then those go up to 30-40%. Again, retethering in, in EDS, we don't know. My personal experience is the only few patients that uh, have EDS, not all of them uh, recurred, but my only recurrence of a tether cord is an EDS patient. One case over a lot of tether cord. Well, it's more than the non-EDS patients, but I can't tell you for sure that it's higher. And therefore, first, how do we investigate um, whether it's really retethered or not? Because going to the OR is not the way of, uh, of investigating. So I think we need a team, and in the team you need a neurosurgeon, probably a neurologist, a urologist, genetics, and anesthesia would be good to help with the pain, especially if we have to tell the patient, we don't think it's retethered, and then now deal with it. Support team, ideally, would be to have a nurse practitioner, some physiotherapist, pain management again, and social work. Radiologically, we still don't really have the answer. My preference is to do a prone MRI, because that way I have the impression that if, the, if it's actually retethered, it's going to keep up behind, and if you do a supine MRI, typically your spinal cord is behind because it's just lying with gravity. If you do it prone, then typically gravity should make your spinal cord come in front, and therefore I'd rather have a prone MRI than a supine or even an upright MRI. So what are the unanswered questions? Is the in incidence of tethering and retethering higher in EDS? So we don't have anything published right now. We have to work on that. But if it's true, then one possible reason might actually be linked to inflammation, especially if you see that in an adult population instead of a child's population. And therefore, should we change, first, our diagnostic approach, and second, our operative approach? The reason I'm saying that is scarring is slightly diffi more difficult, and therefore, retethering might happen more in EDS patients just because of the way we operate. So if we do a big incision, then you have more risk of um, retethering. Is surgery the only option if the et etiology is inflammatory? So my conclusion is a lot of work is needed. In patients with symptoms of tether cord with other EDS symptoms, I think for us it's to actually think that we should investigate for EDS. Overall, try to minimize surgical approach in patients with EDS, as scarring might be more complex. The need of a multidisciplinary team care to take care of patients. And then we need multicentric studies and population studies to actually answer the questions. And now your turn for questions. Okay, thank you, Sandrine.